morning. Someone should. I gotta hold this up where you can see it. The camera doesn't have a whole lot of up and down, but it's got way too much wide side to side. All right. So a little change of plan this morning. I was planning to um, hit a little bit onto dry farm concepts, but instead, We're going to look at uh, Dr. Uh, Nahas, MD, and some of his talking, and we're going to look at some word entomology and continue the discussion that I was heading there prior, and it'll bring us into um, where I'm going to start going into uh, dry farming and terroir and localities and stuff like that after uh, I, I bring this to a conclusion. Um, also, uh, first off, I hope I can keep this in an hour and get this done by 8 o'clock, but I wanted to um, hit on... What is a paradigm shift? So straight up, what do I mean when I title this show Paradigm Shift? Um, it's a, a paradigm is when you have this thought process that everyone conjoins to and it's agreed upon is this is how it is. And so a paradigm of one time we always think of, and, and this is a paradigm in and of itself, as we say back in the old days, everyone thought the earth was flat, right? And now we have flat earthers and that's their paradigm, okay? So, but today we have this paradigm that everyone thought the earth was flat back then when people probably didn't actually necessarily, there was a point definitely when when this the, the guy with the D at the start of his name went and uh, saw that the sticks were like had different shadows by the well or wherever it was and had to pay the guys to walk the distance and figure out how much curvature was by doing the, the geometry. But um, and that shifted the paradigm. OK, so um, what are some other paradigms? Oh, here, here's one from the ski industry. We had. Um, skiing was really hard and um, people were shifting into snowboarding because it was easy. And then all of a sudden they adapted the shape of the snowboard to the ski and put all that side cut on and made it easy. And that created a paradigm in the skiers that like people held on to skiing straight skis because it was harder. And they wanted to um, actually literally have um, be, you know, have this paradigm of being an old school hard case. Right. So um, paradigm is meaning uh, this, 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 this thought, uh, group of thought that we have that says this is how it is, but it's not necessarily the way it really is. And so a paradigm shift, um, you know, just crush the paradigm and look at a whole nother thing. So, so the Phoenix is a great way of thinking about that, where, where how, um, you know, you, you burn down and, and come back with a greater color, full spectrum of, of what is. So this might look a little weird. I got, I've got i got the split screen figured out here tonight. And basically what I'm going to be doing is reading from this uh, writings that I found in a PDF. I found it actually from um, looking around on French Cannoli's site. And um, he and I got into a big argument one time about the meaning of Keefe. And um, somehow he misunderstood an awesome man, very passionate about everything. And, and I make better hash and I grow better hash plants and I breed better hash plants because I have Frenchie. Um, praise the man. And... Um, but unfortunately, I never got to share any with him and, 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 and try and clear this up with him. But it was uh, over the word keef. And we can read about it here in this. Uh, I hope I get to, to that point. And I, I broke out an old dictionary. I collect dictionaries. I like etymology. I like to understand the meaning of words and where they come from. I'm extremely dyslexic. And so you see me typing all the time. And I can't type. I can't write for shit unless I really slow down. But you can see the way I talk. My mind just goes. Doo, doo, doo. And, and so it's, yeah, I don't really stop to to, and I apologize about that at times. I know the hardest part is when somebody trying to translate it to another language. So anytime you see me do that and, and you're speaking another language, go ahead, please straighten me and ask me, hey, can you clarify that stuff, right? Um, so the word keef, right? And, and we all use it the way we use it and have used it. And I use it since I was a kid. And, and I have a dictionary from the year I was born, 1971, that shows uh, word etymology of it going back 100 years and it hits on it in here and one thing we keep in mind is the tobacco didn't get to um the the old world until people came to the new world and got it from the native americans and um brought it back to europe and it became this craze and they brought the tube pipe with them and 
Um, my understanding is that there was definitely water pipes being used in Southern Africa, but they didn't intermix with the areas we're going to talk about right now. And you'll see that these people were using concoctions and preparations and liquids and stuff, but not necessarily, you know, they're eating hash, but they're not smoking it anywhere. And, and yes, there were brassiers, right, where you put a coal in, in some in areas. So anyhow, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to uh, go ahead and just get on to reading this here, and I'm going to try and change my screen so I don't look so funny as I'm reading. Shrink me down. And so again, this is from Gabriel Nehas, MD, and he wasn't necessarily a proponent of cannabis, but he definitely studied it and he had a position to do so. He was uh, the Department of Anesthesiology at Columbia University in, in New York. And um, so, so, but he studied like all aspects of these things. And, and it wasn't just cannabis that he studied, um, all sorts of chemistry and, and how it came from the old ways to the new. And uh, so, so this is a, from an article based on a forthcoming book, Escape of the Great Gen Escape of the Genie, History of Hashish from the same guy. And I'm gonna do my best not to um, like totally verbatim this stuff, but I'm kind of gonna read it and put some, some uh, context to it. So, um, well, I meant to pull up this guy. He's a buddy of mine. I'm actually a patient. So, get started here. Cannabis was used as an intoxicant bang in India and Iran as far back as 1000 BC. It was adopted in the Muslim, Muslim Middle East 1800 years later, two centuries after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Indeed, during his lifetime, the use of cannabis preparations known in the Middle East as hashish, which means grass in Arabic, was unknown. Okay, so word etymology. Why do we call it grass? <laughs> and um, where does these different, this, this is going to feed into a little bit later, um, but where do these terms come from? Um, uh, and, and how long has it been being used, right? Um so that was, uh, we're talking like 800 uh, BC or AD, I'm sorry. Um, so yes, known in the Middle East as hashish, which means grass, quote unquote, in Arabic was unknown. This might be the reason why the prophet did not explicitly forbid the Holy Quran intoxication by cannabis, although he pro proscribed that indeed by fermented beverages, alcohol, wine, and beer, were illegal in the book, right? So, so uh, Muslims aren't supposed to be. It's kind of weird because you'll see through this, and I've met people from uh, like Iran when I ran my farm stall that they talk about like, oh, we're not supposed to, but you know, we always make vinegar in that stage in between. Everybody from grandma to the little kid would tip the lid up and sip a little bit of the the, the alcohol while it was fermenting, and then so it's uh, it's always been around. Um, there's no evidence that the Arabs became familiar with the intoxicating properties of hashish before the ninth century. At that time, they had already conquered Iraq and Syria and swept eastward to the border of Persia in Central Asia and westward through Asia Minor, North Africa and Spain. It was in 752 that the relentless Muslim expansion was halted by Poitiers and the, by the Frankish king Charles Martel. In the ninth century, well after the establishment in AD 750, the splendidus Absid Caliphate in Baghdad noted for its universities, Arab scholars translated the Greek text of Diosocrates, Dioscorides. Let's see, I brought my spectacles along just because I'm going with them up. All right. Dioscorides in Galen and became familiar with the medicinal properties of cannabis. One physician of the early 10th century, Ibn Wasah, wa, wa, shia, warned of the possible complications resulting from the use of hashish in his book on poisons. He claimed that the plant extract, this is in the 10th century, uh, plant extract caused death when mixed with other drugs. Of course, it's the other drugs causing death we now know. Um, the Persian boar, al Rais. Uh, physician counseled against its over prescribing, over prescribing it, and traders traveling Persia and India and Central Asia also may have spread knowledge of the plant's medicinal purposes. According to Ed Rosenthal, it was not until late in the ninth century that 
the use of hashish, and that was, uh, let's see, use of hashish as an intoxicant surfaced in Islam. Called hashish instead of bang, or B-H-A-N-G, the Hindu designation, which today I utilize for the term, I, I take like raw leaf and uh, put it in steaming milk and blend it, like in, in, and totally blend it. And that's what I use the word bong for. And it's super exhilarating. If you've never done that, please do. Take some raw fresh leaf and just put it in, in a blender with some hot milk. And, and, and other people make it extremely stronger. And, and But I find that just that is one of the most exhilarating foods I've ever consumed. And I have so much freaking energy and I feel like a god himself. And um, we go into a Santi just that way. Uh, anyhow, so where was I? So the Hindu designation, it was first consumed by members of the religious Persian and Iraqi sects located in the eastern periphery of the Islamic Empire, which bordered the central steppes where the plant had its origins. And there it was little cultural opposition at first because the Holy Quran, which formulates in detail all the rules of daily Muslim living, does not forbid explicitly the consumption of cannabis. Although it pros proscribes the use of fermented beverages. In around AD 1000, Fatima King al-Hakim issued an edict prohibiting the sale of alcohol throughout Syria and Egypt, but did not ban cannabis. In the 11th century, a Turkish people, the Seljuk, captured Baghdad and assumed effective power. Although they retained the Abs Abbasids as a figureheads, the use of hashish became popular in Islamic society and frequently mentioned in its literature in the zenith of the power of the Seljuks. When they had made additional conquests and converts in the Middle East at the same time, fended off an invasion by the Crusaders. The story of uh, Hassan e Saban. So back at that time, fended off the invasion by the Crusaders. They had hemp already in, in the um, Western um, Europe. And the Crusaders were quite possibly wearing hemp spun clothing when they made this uh, offense against the, the Muslims on, on uh, whichever sub-crusade uh, that would have been. Okay, here comes some myth busting. Everyone talks about the Hashishans. And this is a great set. I used to believe it. I used to tell the story, the Hashishan story. Uh, and um, But it, it's mythos. And so here is some, here is some, um, some factualization or... or Perhaps this is just another paradigm because it's all history and whose story is it, right? So the story, and he even puts it that way, of Hassin e Saban is familiar to any. He was an Ismaili fanatic leader who in 1090 founded in Persia the Order of Hashishans. And that's spelled S-H-S-A-S-H-I-S-H-I-Y-A-N-S in English and often returned, referred to in the West as assassins. Now, please note that this is spelled a little bit different than the different hashish and such words used um, in other spots. But um, so we're so here I am. So um, also often refer, referred to in the West as assassins because they murdered their political opponents. Marco Polo, the Venetian explorer, related how Hassan the old man of the mountain snared young men and fed them a secret potion in the splendid gardens of his fortress, the Alamat. In this earthly paradise, their main activity was to make love to sensuous women. This way, Hassan kept his young followers under his spell and was able to send them on dangerous missions to assassinate his opponents. He promised the young men, upon your return, my angels shall bear you into paradise. The 70 virgins and all of that, right? So the question is, to the nature of the potion given by Hassan was, and, and uh, Hassan also, people say uh, Hashishan Hassan, right? Assassin Hassan, all that stuff feeds into the, like, the mystery of this whole story anyhow. But, uh, so the question of the nature of the potion given by Hassan was answered in 1818 by Sylvester de Sese, who believed that it was Hashish. And also that the name Assassins derived from the name of Hassan's followers, Hashishians. And many accept this interpretation, which has been ever since to ever used used ever since to link the use of hashish with violent behavior. Although often quoted, it is not supported by historical evidence. Dun, dun, dun. There is no doubt that the old man on the mountain, Hassan, was the shrewd Ismaili, 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 Isma
leader of the group of religious fanatics who defended an impregnable mountain fortress on the Persian border, that he indoctrinated some of his loyal followers, the Fadai, blindly to carry out his orders is also true. And these orders sometimes included assassinating Hassan's, assassinating Hassan's enemies. Hashish, which sounds closer? Hashishans? Hashish? Hassan? Assassination? Um, several Arab sultans, as well as leaders of the Crusades, were murdered by these terrorists of the 12th century. Among them was Conrad Marquis de Montferrat, Montferrat, assassinated by one of Hassan's followers who had penetrated the Crusades camp disguised as a monk. Let's talk about freaking old spycraft, right? So feared was the old man that even Saladin, one of the most famous Muslim journals of his time, had to abandon his plan to storm the Alamut. Alamut? It's A-L-A-M-U-T is the name of the fortress. So the only evidence that Hassan actually gave hashish to his followers, however, is Marcos Polo's anecdotal report, which vaguely mentions a potion, but no drug by name. Somebody else later came along and added that on and made a proposition in the 1818 uh, writings that he made. And so... Um, If the old man did dispense hashish, he must have used its euphoria quality sparingly, just enough to give his devotees a preview of the joys of the paradise Muhammad had promised to the faithful who died in battle. There is another explanation why his followers, the followers of Hassan, were called hashishia, a term which would seem to designate the users of hashish numerous at the time. According to Lewis, an author, the followers of Hassan were nicknamed Hashishia, and this is spelled, quote, S -H, excuse me, H A S H I S H I Y A A or A B A H. I am so dyslexic and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I'm reading so well. Um, bear with me. Um, not to mention my concussions and et cetera. Uh, little doctor dream to start the morning, and away we go. I'm drinking mint tea, by the way. Moroccan style. Um, okay, according to Lewis, the followers of Hassan, uh, Hassan were nicknamed Hashishia as an expression of contempt for their wild beliefs and extravagant behavior. It was a derisive comment on their conduct rather than a description of their practices. So this is a whole other word etymology that um, another source comments that the reason for the choice of the term Hashishia might have been to confer on the partisans of Hassan the low and disreputable character attributed by some scholars to hashish eaters. Okay, so we'll see in some poetry otherwise further down if I get to it, how it talks about um, um, alcohol was consumed by the kings and noble people and um, hashish was only available because it was expensive to drink alcohol to the, um, the dregs of the society at the time. So... Um, so while, uh, let's see, where'd that one go? All right. So rather than the actual devotion of Hassan's followers to the drug, it was a way to discredit them as well as hashish. In any event, the mention of the hashishia reported in Arabic texts in 1125 indicates that the use of hashish was common enough at the time, so it could appear as an official document and require no explanation whatsoever. So the nickname Hashishia, with its extensive use of hashish, appeared to have surfaced during the late 11th century. Both may have been promoted by the real or alleged use of cannabis by Hassan's devotees who were engaged in spreading a vast network of open and secret influence of the Muslim world, world from Egypt to Iran and beyond. Other than the sect which, the other sect which used hashish during the, okay, so basically it kind of leaves it hanging there. We really, it could be, it could be, um, and yes, there's so there's a lot more root word etymology stuff that comes from all that, and and we're talking translations and going through different languages and coming out of, you know, and we'll, I'll, I'll do a show one of these days that talks about the um, canvas in the Old Testament, right, and looking at the the um, um, the fellows in Israel who were devotees of, of Judaism who were showing proper etymology of these words that we have translated and made wrong, and then. The sweet cane and fragrant crane are actually cannabis, and and they show that the etymology going back into Greek and, and how it translates and stuff. So this stuff is important and understanding how like we can't just say this, these words don't mean these things or, or we we just 
when we come up, I, I was saying in the past two episodes, when we come up with new words, we don't, or new systems of classification, we don't just throw out the old stuff. It adds to our understanding. Um, it it, it, it uh, adds to our understanding in different ways that we can communicate and, and classify as we have deeper comprehension of, of the complexity of the plant. So um, let's see. Uh, other sect that was using hashish around the 12th century, according to the Arabic historians, was the Sufis, a mystical branch of Islam that was first appeared the eighth the end of the eighth century. The Arabs and uh, Sufism wearers of wool were dedicated to hours of fasting, prayer, and solitary meditation, stressed self denial, shunned worldly pleasures. And the story is told by Al Ukbari that cannabis was discovered by the religious leader Sha Shaikh Haidar. A founder of the Haidari order of Sufis uh, in Karasan, Karasan, northwest Iran and Afghanistan. Haidar lived in a monastery in the mountains of Rama around 1200 AD. While walking in the countryside in the midday heat, he discovered the divine properties of the plant that appeased hunger and thirst while giving joy. Okay, so look at this. This is a completely different discovery. It isn't even, it isn't even that 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 the uh, the hindus traded with the muslims right it wasn't that the muslims were conquering the hindus and found this stuff right this is a whole nother derivation uh, origin of a form of hashish separate from right okay now this already did you see the, these things translated in 800 it, it came over but but here we are in in 1200 when this guy finds it Again, right? Growing wild. Whether somebody had spread the seed there or where it was there originally. And where is he? In the mountains of Rama um, in Khorasan in northwest Iran and Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, in 1200, while walking the countryside in midday heat, he discovered the divine properties of a plant that appeased hunger and thirst while giving joy. He told his disciples, Oh, my God has bestowed upon you a special favor the virtues of this plant, which will dis dissipate the shadows that cloud your souls and brighten your spirits. Haidar, like the Hindu priest 2,000 years before him, recommended that his followers conceal from the people the divine properties of this precious herb. But such secrets cannot be kept for centuries. And after his death, his disciples extolled the wonderful qualities of the magic plant. Abandon wine, take the cup of Haidar, this cup which has the fragrance of amber and sparkles like a green emerald. Egyptian historian and Sufi critic Al Makrizi. All right, so that there, <clears throat> I wonder if they were um, actually using. Uh, ooh, I have amazing colors in the sky going off right now pinks and purples. It's a beautiful dawn. Um, if they're using a brazier at that point already, uh, um, which has the, you know, take the cup of hate or take this, this cup, which has the fragrance of amber and sparkles like a green emerald. Um, while it is unlikely that Haider discovered the mind-altering properties of cannabis, he might have developed a special recipe for consuming the plant, meaning that other people had it figured out, right? And he found it again. So the wheel was discovered in many places, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he might have developed a special recipe for consuming the plant, even though the story of the old monk may be apocryphal. There's one I don't know. A P O. C R Y P H A L. Someone want to look it up? Um, nonetheless, some of the Sufis did use hashish in their religious observer observances and spread its consumption throughout Islamic society, introducing it to Syria and Egypt. Most of the Sufis were recruited from among the poor who could not afford wine, which, despite Quranic ban, was abundantly used by the rich. Some Sufis claimed by as many Indian holy men had 20 centuries earlier that the gentle herb expanded consciousness, brought insight, peace, and response, repose, and closeness to God. Abel has compared, and this is a writer being quoted, um, compared the Sufis with the hippies of modern America, and Hadar with Timothy Leary, and Hadari monasteries with communes. Both group, okay, let's take in mind, I think this was written in 1982, right? Um, and that's, so, so separate us from today, 
right? We're, we're in a whole nother, we've got all this different language. We've got all these cons that we've super, at this point now, we've totally super poly hybridized everything. And we've got these new structural ways of describing things, but they do not replace any of this thousands of years old concepts and information, right? Um, Here's something interesting here. I see people uh, praising God in, in different uh, um, old backgrounds. I, I, I'm discussing somebody. Um, I've been uh, taking various cactus into steward here at my plant sanctuary, a sacred plant sanctuary. And um, we've got some more coming soon. I believe I uh, need to drop an address to a friend. But um, the, the um, some of the ones I have come from like old Catholic mission grounds in California. Here's what's it's crazy is California is actually, you can find the etymology of that and, and word, and it comes from the mystical caliphate from one of the old uh, Muslim um, uh, mystical stories, right? So California is like the perfect, holy, like heaven place on earth, right? <laughs> crazy story. Um, anyhow, uh, a little aside on some other um, etymology and cactus and religion and spirituality. And um, so uh, I prescribe to no religion besides that of the redwood tree. It is the same. Okay. Cause let's see, where was I? Oh, All right. Both groups, it is true, use the drug to pro proselytize and claim that it would contribute individual enlightenment and self-improvement. The analogy is misleading, however, because the hippies and Leary did not belong to any formal religious group and, in addition to cannabis, used many other drugs such as LSD to reproduce a chemically induced alteration of consciousness. Sufism, and of course, they didn't have a whole lot of other psychedelic drugs back then would they had used them if they had access to them um okay so maybe they did where, where do you get these designs you know not just so so this is some crazy stuff the the design behind me come is, is like copy out of like the tops of temples right the basic mosaic but what is it it's it, it it turns out that these are like um the the sound vibration um acoustic uh physical representation patterns okay and how do you find that stuff? How do you find the base geometry without having these mind-expanding um, chemistries that we have access to at different times throughout history and such? Just another aside on, on mysticism. Um, all right, so Sufis then, uh, most Sufis then and now practice asceticism in a drug-free life to reach true mystical experience. And this can be done too, and we know this through deep meditation, uh, have breathing exercises and stuff. And, and I've actually experienced a full uh, DMT release. I've never taken DMT as a uh, concentrate, but I've learned to release DMT through breathing exercises and meditation and stuff. And some of the things that Wim Hof teaches, okay, you can really get yourself into out-of-body experiences without any, once you know it's there. Um, so all, all the great Sufi mystics and saints, such as Al-Kabani, al um Al-Ghazani, Ghazali and all Islami all rejected the use of psychoactive drugs, which they considered a diabolic perversion. Today, the order comprises thousands of deeply serious and devout men and women in nearly every Islamic country. Of all Muslims, they probably are the most aloof and accessible to Europeans, and they practice a strict ascetic discipline to cleanse body and soul. Um, the, the history versus today, right? Um, Record, let's see, how am I doing for time? Halfway through, and how many pages am I into it? Five of 18. I don't know if I'll get through the whole thing, but we'll, we'll get probably to where I wanted to. According to history of the Hashisha and the defiant faction of the Sufi sector, clearly indicate the increased cannabis use during the 12th century among religious sects located in the eastern periphery of the Arabic Empire. During the same period that the Sufis introduced cannabis, along with opium, into Egypt, at the end of the 12th century, alcohol production and sale was prohibited by the Ayyubid king Al-Fadal Al -Fadal in Egypt and Syria. Arab scientists had invented the Alambic for the distillation of fermented beverages into alcohol, but since there was no ban on cannabis cultivation or use by 13th century, the use of hashish had spread to the general population of the Islamic world 
and had gained converts in the West as well, from Egypt to Spain. So there we have we have Spain having drug types in the 13th century is how far your guys' history goes back as far as uh, this uh, annotation goes. Uh, and this is being, again, this is a doctor of, of um, anesthesiology who's trying to find out the true histories, the chemistry and everything. And, and, and if there's any use you can find for this. Um, yeah, Fried Piper, I understand you here. I've, um, I understand we produce it in our brain. And so I like, um, yeah, we don't need to have, that's not this discussion. Um, I, I've been actually wearing a sweater from Peru for 30 years. It's made with the vines dye. I've been, <laughs> it was, uh, for a century, let's see, where was I? Um, I was talking about, so the 12th century in Spain, um, Production and sale, uh, since there is no ban, there we go. Okay, 13th century Spanish. Okay, this is an important thing I need you all to hear. Okay. Um, 13th century Spanish botanist, Ibn Baytar, reporting on his trip, that's B, it, Baytar, B-A-I-T-A-R, reporting on his trip to Egypt, describes the cultivation of Conab in D. Okay, this is in the 13th century, 1200 something. And Conab, K O N N A B I N D I. This is a Spanish botanist. At the time, this would have been um, um, possibly a Muslim, clear, uh, uh, someone who studies in all these in, uh, universities that they had, right? And like Morocco and, and Baghdad had these in, uh, universities. And so they had. Um, this, and this is right before European really started going hard on, on producing uh, herbar herbariums and things like that, um, which um, and their travels and, and, and conquering and stuff. But again, so it's Spanish botanist, Ibn Baytar, reporting on his trip to Egypt, describes the cultivation of Canob Indy. And then the next quotation is Cannabis Indica. And this is literally the first documented use of the term Indy. Okay, or Indica, and in the local population, we already referred to, we already described uh, how the term hashish was utilized by the local population to describe the plant, which meant grass in Arabic. Correct? Okay, so the originally we had we had cannabis indica was the first scientific designation, and it was applied to the plants used for making hashish. Okay, and this is this is comes back in to where it's reapplied centuries later when Europeans found that there was a difference between the hemp plant that was designated by Linnaeus as um, can, cannabis sativa L, right? And it's totally pointed out in the etymol in the um, taxono taxonomy this um, distinctive description pointing out very obvious visual and actually chemotogric differences. They didn't have chemotography back then, but they understood that this one got you a high fuck, the one that they called indica later on, and the other one didn't quite so much. And if it did, it was more in your headspace. This stuff was the original designation separations. Um, anyhow, so... Back to this, and this is a huge point where I've been leading up to in three shows, and I've been trying to point this stuff out to people, and it's like, stop telling me not to use these words the way I use them in the context I use them in. And, and I'm going to build up a chart that shows how where the modern stuff fits in in between it all, and, and we can still use them all. But that's that's forthcoming still. Um, back to this, uh, uh, I've got 20 minutes to keep reading through. And um, so a 13th century Spanish botanist, Ibn Bitar, reporting on his trip to Egypt, describes the cultivation of Kanab and the cannabis indica, which was called hashish by the local population. He noted that eating hashish primarily by the Sufis for the religious devotions produced intoxication, jocularity, and a dreamlike state. He was first the first scientist to remark that the drug, also called dementia, caused dementia. He had little regard for the Sufis he met, referring to them as men of the vilest class. 
During the period that Ibn Betar traveled through Egypt, the Mongols entered Persia in their westward attempt to overrun the Arab Empire. For more than a century, they spread terror, dislocation, and invaded areas. Baghdad was sacked in 1258, and these fierce warriors were familiar with both cannabis and alcohol. In fact, some Arab historians, Ibn Taymiyyah and al zarqurashi blame the spread of hashish in the 13th century to the Mongol invasions. There is little evidence for such a contention, however, since the consumption of cannabis preceded the Mongol invasions by many years. Still, by driving eastern refugees... Driving eastern refugees, many of them Sufis, to the urban areas of Egypt and Syria, the Mongols may in that way have contributed to the westward spread of hashish. In the middle of the 13th century, the Malamuks overthrew the Arabid dynasty in Syria, A-Y-Y-U-B-I-D, Ayyubid dynasty in Syria and Egypt, thereby inaugurating a lengthy period of economic, social, and cultural decadence with coincidence which coinc coincided with widespread use of hashish among common people. The somber period of Egyptian history, 1250 to 1571, was followed by the ruthless domination of the Ottoman Empire, which lasted until 1804. For centuries, a privileged and dissolute Caesarian or Turkish ruling class alien to Egypt exploited the indigenous agrarian laborers. Hashish consumption was considered to oppressor it was common to oppressor and oppressed alike. The rulers took it to enhance their pleasure and the peasants to escape their dreariness of their daily lives. Uh, unfavorable social consequences probably accompany the hashish habit because early social reformers, some sultans, emirs of Persia, Turkey, or Egypt, tried repeatedly to reverse the trend toward cannabis use among abuse among the people. As the popular hashish increased, uh, um, it just continues on describing coming on, and that that really hits some of the main stuff I wanted you to to, to hear. Where where that word cannabis indica originated? The Islamic word for the in the Islamic world in the 14th century, the use of hashish became more prevalent, and spread along the east coast of Africa and west to North Africa and Spain. The botanist Ibn Batuta. His travels from Persia to East Africa in 1348 repeated that hashish was eaten by the people, sometimes even in mosques, right? And that this kind of leads towards my my discussion about the the two pipes of Native American tobacco smoking moving into Europe with tobacco and coming back to um, uh, going to China, becoming a bong, and coming back into um, the uh, Muslim countries as uh, as a bong uh, for smoking hash that way and all the chillum and all that stuff deriving from the tobacco pipe. And then this, this here really shows us that the water pipes that they found in South Africa a hundred years ago, finally exposed about, a, about uh, 1910 and people were laughing when they, the uh, anthropologist came out and said, Hey, this is a totally different mm, device than, you know, culturally and practically than, than what we have in the rest of culture. And, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, again, they're, be, they're eating the stuff. Okay, so in Morocco, hashish, let's see, let me get back. So reported that hashish was being eaten by the people, sometimes even in mosques. He also mentioned that the use of alcohol among Muslims, upper classes in Morocco, hashish was called kaif known as Kief today, and was used in religious ceremonies of the Sanusi sect. So in, in my conversation with um, Frenchie on this, he's like, Craig, yeah, they were calling this stuff uh, Kief or Kaif, K-A-I-F, and it's the same etymology that was shown in, in my big, giant, fat um, um, dictionary that's as old as I am. But, uh, so, so, uh, but they didn't have tobacco back then. And they were eating the stuff, right? And so um, I love you, Hef Ranchi. Um, uh, I'm wrong sometimes, too. And I, I appreciate people who show it to me when I am uh, and I can learn and move forward. Um, and I hope everybody can do that. And that's that's the point here of me uh, rolling through. This is not just something you can do in a sound bite or a, a quick little, this is three, you know, 40 minute, uh, one hour, you know, two and a half hours of discussion of me, of me not even discussing, just me pointing out this um argument of why we don't just disregard these words um or or we you know what they are um is what they are i guess so 
He also mentioned he is okay. Marco Ortizan was used in religious ceremonies. The Sunni sect. The drug was also openly used, consumed in southern Spain until that country's reconquest by Isabella, the Catholic, and reestablishment of the firm grip of the Roman Catholic Church. And you know, through Catholicism, they maintain uh, control of of the secrets, right? I, I did um, LSD with um, priest initiates um, of the Jesuits. Um, kind of weird. We didn't actually know each other were tripping. Like, would we all go out camp trip um, backpacking? We had this this one particular priest that most of them drank a lot and a few of them smoked, um, but. The the uh, and I'm not going to say that's everyone in, in Catholicism is doing that stuff at all, by no means. You know, it's it's uh, or any other right. It's it's just like people. There's a small percentage of us that are true aficionados or um, daily consumers of cannabis in today's society, compared to the amount of people who actually use cannabis, right? And it's so don't. I uh, I went to Jesuit high school and like ate lunch with them every day in their private courtyard from. Um, I had a slightly different experience. Um, I'm not normal. <laughs> um, yeah, Jesuits, I say. Um, luminaries, not Illuminatis. Luminaries. The I-L in Latin is a negatory or a creator of darkness instead of one who gives light and knowledge. I, I am uh, incendi proletarius. I am the protector of fire and the giver of knowledge and, and the keeper of light. Um, giver of light, keeper of knowledge. Anyhow, um, there was anything else in here I wanted to see. Uh, there was that stuff I wanted to hit on, the key. I'm not sure. Just talks about when it was it made illegal and stuff. And they tried, just like, you know, it says, it says is it the art of war or just the uh, Zen? There's a... Uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's going to come again, right, Buddha boy? <laughs> yes, I am. I'm the master. Paul. He called me a pollen checker and then described exactly my experience because I am a, um, I work with land race and then described my 35 years of working with land race is what makes it master. <laughs> that was epic, though. It's OK, because he doesn't know who I am or anything about me. That's nah, fine. I I don't I. He know not what he does, right? Um, so, yeah, I encourage you all to read through this. You can find it through um, Frenchie's page. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what's this say? Cannabis was not as prevalent in Turkey as in the Arabian provinces of the Ottoman Empire, Syria, and Egypt. The ruling classes adapted habits. Um, of the conquered Greek and Armenian minorities used alcohol and wine preferentially, while the less fortunate had to be content with hashish. The 17th century uh, historian Julio Gio Effendi reports that in Constantinople there were more than a thousand beer shops, 104 wine distributors, but only 60 places where hashish were sold and smoked. Um, this goes into some of the class separation and stuff like that. That's what I was talking about. Um, again, um, here's another one from Travels in Egypt. C. Sinani from France, 1790. The Arabs were thrown into a sort of pleasing inebriety at a state of reverie that inspires gaiety at times and agreeable dreams. This kind of annihilation of the faculty of thinking, this kind of slumber of the soul, bears no resemblance to the intoxication produced by wine or strong liquors and the French language affords no terms by which it can be expressed. The Arabs give the name of Kif, K-I-F, to this voluptuous vocity of mind, this sort of fascinating super. And so that was the original etymology of the word Kif in, in all of the books and uh, um, uh, dictionaries that I, uh, when I really studied that word Keith that we use and I've been using since I was a kid and I had a friend that was named Keith actually, actually his name is Kiefer and we called him Keith for short. But um, yeah, I think it was spelled kind of like the probiotic drink kefir. But but so kef, um, uh was originally meant to feel good. It was the best translation overall I can find from that etymology, right? Um,
Interested. I so so he's on Spanish uh, botanist Dibar Ibn Baitar again. He traveled through North Africa and he's in Morocco, I think, and reported the use and cultivation of cannabis was prevalent in Egypt, was not seen in the rest of North Africa. And so we saw above and by the 17th century, though, it was all down the eastern side um, wherever Islam had moved. But um, medical use of cannabis. During all these centuries, cannabis continued to be used for medical purposes. Muslim physicians found more medical uses for cannabis than had been reported in the text of Galen and Discordes. Dios or Dios Corridus. The physician Al Razi, 865 925, refers to using hemp leaves as a medicament for the ear and prescribes them for dandruff and for dissolving flatulence. He also des describes their curative power in cases of epilepsy. Rumpius, a German botanist, describes his herbarium, the Muslim use of cannabis to treat asthma, gonorrhea, constipation, and as an antidote for poisoning. Their physicians reported that hashish was used to stimulate the appetite. Um, al Bari in 1251 produced a craving for sweets, and others describe it as a beautiful music to the sense of hearing. Although it opened the gates of desire, prolonged use was believed. Prolong oh, I missed my spot. Uh, you, you stimulate the, uh, seven. oh, prolonged use, the, listen here, prolonged use was believed to cut off the desire for sexual intercourse. So I found that a couple of different spots reading through this, that that was one of the old reports from, from the, the shuts down semen production and stuff. And none of that seems to have been proven out to be true. I think it's just that people were lazy and didn't see, um, less attractive women, or, or, or I think maybe even like if you're not an alcohol or, I don't know, but it never slowed me down. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, it goes on for 15 pages, and uh, I'm kind of running out of time. Yeah, words can be used to hide history. This is true. And, and anyone who's seeing this in, later on, if you don't you go back and read the, uh, the live, um, the live uh, chat. And you'll be able to see what um, if I'm returning to if I all of a sudden just start rambling funny. Um, let's see. Everything's cheap. Life is cheap. Gonna make some waffles. Freedom is defined. Freedom is denied. All sorts of cool. Anyhow, um, you know, so again, this is the beginning of the usage of, of cannabis indica and, and keef and where the word hashish and grass come from. These are all old. Um, I mean, we're here, another side, the alfalfa, that is in, uh, an old Arabic word as well. And um, comes from the name, it's like they were feeding it their horses. And um, there's a big contention between the origins of, of where domesticated horses come from today and stuff with some of uh, the white culture stuff. And I'm as white as it gets. and, and I, it's like we're all human beings. We're all citizens of Lana Ikea, right? We're all living here on the third stone from the sun. Let's all get along proper. There's, there's, uh, it's tough. There's not enough room for all the rest of the creation once we start expanding out. Um, I got 10 minutes left. I think, I think they spelled it like that. Kiefer, K-I-E-F-E-R. I think that's exactly, and then we, we shortened it down. There might have been two Fs when they spelled his name. I honestly, I, I'd have to go grab um, um, your book. This is, I'm going to do a whole show on something. I, I'll see if I can pull this out real quick. So some of you might know, I was artist in residence in Yellowstone National Park at one time. And um, my best friend from college, he uh, moved up there when we moved out of, got out of college and uh, I ran into him again and... Uh, started hanging out up there. Um, and I came up with this story about the ant and the bison. And we think about how many, um, you know, there, there's these huge debates and, and actually Jesuits taught me about um, um, how we were changing our environment and stuff. And these guys all had like two and three doctorates and various, uh, each of them had a religious doctorate, right, um, as well as, um, you know, science and math and, and philosophy and things like that. So, 
uh, they, they, were, they were tripping out this 15, 16 year old kid could have these conversations with them. But I would already gone like to the halls of Akasha in, in out of body meditation and such. And, um, you know, 15, I, I had some pretty s- severe, you could call it um, psycho experiences, 72 hours of, of, of LSD on one trip at a dead show. It was my induction. So whatever you're going to tell me about Dean for 15 minutes, I know it goes to a whole other spot, but yes, I've been able to release it through my own mind. Um, we do produce it and stuff. And, and uh, you know, they, have, they have these yogis and you know, that, that uh, are able to produce, produce um, um, the nectar from the palate, right? And go for 20 years without eating and things. So, um, none of the stuff can really be scientifically shown, but right, we, we can't, uh, the science of the doctor, the the, the, the the Jesuits told me about global warming hasn't changed at all. And I haven't seen anything to counter it. And I've seen a lot of more information that I've questioned myself several times. And one of the biggest things I questioned myself was reading the writings of, of John Muir when he went looking for Glacier Bay. And he was taken in, in, uh, by historical and you can read about in, in Jack London's writings as well. And um, so, uh, <laughs> no, that's that's my beard sides. But... <laughs> I got a few braids. I got a few tied up. Yeah, I got, I got, I got another one back there. I love pink. I'm like, yeah, I just love pink. It's one of my favorite colors. Um, so, so, but yeah, read about the Glacier Bay, and um, that really made me question all of the science because, and then I, but I found history for, showed that that was the end of the Little Ice Age, right? And so there was this massive ice discharge um, that, that occurred when when um, his guide took him in to find uh, the, these massive glaciers. And, and there was like all of a sudden like five miles more of bay that hadn't been there the last time this guy went seal hunting there, right? And uh, But then again, you, you find it's like, okay, that's the end of the Little Ice Age. And there was this... <clears throat> so you got to look at these bigger, bigger, bigger pictures, right? And um, so living living in Yellowstone, and I, and I came up with a way to, to um, look at a whole other paradigm shift. And, and, and so it's the ant and the bison. And um, let me get real quick a good painting to show you that uh, tells us a little bit of the story. Not really at all, but you know it's a big place Yellowstone is, right? And this is this is like a, a study for a larger painting that I did. Um, the light sucks; so you probably hardly even see it. Went off in the distance there, though, right? There's there's some bison roaming out there. This is this is mammoth. Mammoth Hot Springs, and, and we got we got bison all over the place, right? And it's a big country up there. And uh, so uh, I'm out walking one day through Hayden Valley, and and come across big silverback bison, weighs as big as a Volkswagen, it weighs a ton, and it kills over dead, right? And it's it's dead, and and it kind of sucks, but that's part of the cycle of life, right? And and it'll become grass, it'll become um, you know, there's that skull there that's, that people can rever on and things like that, right? But there's there's also, it's like, there's this red ant sitting there where it falls, boom, just about crushes this red ant. You know, the wind settles down, the dust stops, and there's this dead bison in front of this one red ant. The red ant's like, wow, food, cool. He goes over and takes a bite. And it's like, how much damage is that one little red ant going to do to that? ton of bison nothing right nothing at all um but when he takes that bite and he gets some food and he communicates to all the other ants in the area he sends out a pheromone that says hey i just found fresh dead bison right how many ant hills are there within 100 yards of that dead bison how many ants is in each ant hill okay so all of a sudden, there's millions and millions and millions and millions of ants that have come out, and they each take a few bites. And millions and millions more ants come and take a few bites. And 48 hours later, all there is is a pile of sinew and bones. So now each time we cook breakfast and we heat the house up, we got to open the window and let a little heat out of the house. And every time we cook lunch... Every time we cook dinner, right? That's just a little bit of sunshine that's been stored in petroleum stores and, and ancient plants and animals, that, right? That's been stored away, and now we're releasing that out. And it's not just the heat. 
that's just one aspect of it, right? Um, all of this stuff, all of that stuff adds up. So every, every time you, you know, we're the ant chewing the bison when we deny the, that our lifestyles make a difference, okay? Um, because millions and millions and millions of ants can destroy a ton of meat or, or process it or turn it to a whole different form before you know it. And, and us doing our own thing, going through and just casually doing our thing, we can very easily not understand that we're destroying the habitat for all the rest of the web of life that creates life for us to be here. And that's really why I do these things. And all of this saying there's still Indica and Sativa leads into things like the next step of the conversation about dry farming and looking at global uh, communities and where people grow around the world and how they grow and how much irrigation they use and um, moving back towards uh, hashish and all the extractions and versus flour, which we're all doing. We know that pens is like the number one selling products and industry and things like that. It's also an excellent way to calibrate medicine for folks, right? Not everybody's going to have the opportunity to grow their own garden. Most people don't grow their own tomatoes or food at all. So getting it right and getting these wider possible uh, medicinal um, applications from from the wider stream of, of uh, land races and stuff, all of those things and all of us making a um, contribution to uh, making the world a better place for our grandchildren's grandchildren's is what it's about to me right uh, i want you all having a great day think about um what you can do to make the world a better place right this smile appreciate y'all i'm at uh 56 minutes we're coming on to eight o'clock and uh i want to make sure i shut off by eight o'clock for anyone else that ever comes on at that time i'm not sure what the schedule is if there's anybody um, and that's my personal location time. Cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, whole, there, there's so many lessons I'm going to be teaching uh, on how to do land race and all that stuff. So namaste to back all, to all of you there, too. And we'll go ahead and take it out with a little bit more uh, singing bowl. Oh, <laughs> 